Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So my name is Chris Junkie. I'm here with Global Knowledge, and I want to talk to you today about authoring courses outside of edX Studio, why Global Knowledge did that, uh, and then how we did that. So Global Knowledge produces IT uh, produces training for IT professionals, and we do it in a uh, number of different modalities, primarily instructor-led training, uh, virtual classroom, and also um, obviously the digital platform we're using, um, you know, Open edX. And so we have many different uh, publishing options that we have to account for in our content. Uh, we create instructor materials, student guides, lab guides, worksheets, printed books, and then of course uh, the digital platform content. Uh, so those are all very important, having a single source that we can export in multiple different ways. Uh, the ability to search, so we're, we have a lot of content, so being able to find the asset exactly when we need it uh, is important to us. Uh, reusability, uh, we reuse a lot of content. We have a lot of courses that uh, span uh, domains. So for instance, uh, we have an intro to cybersecurity course and a cybersecurity foundations. And so there's a lot of content that is shared between those. And so we want to be able to reuse that content from one to the other so we're not reauthoring every single time. On versioning, I probably don't have to explain all you why versioning is important. So it's also important to us uh, for, for our content. And so when we looked at these, these needs, um, we found edX Studio wasn't able to handle all of them, right? edX Studio does a lot of things very well, very efficient. Uh, it's pretty easy to author, in, but it didn't meet all of our all of our needs. And so when when we thought about what could what what could meet these needs, edX Studio and I we 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 went for a walk. Uh, we took a walk together, and, and we're thinking about this and pondering it. And all of a sudden, there she goes. She's gorgeous in LCMS. <laughs> What is an LCMS, uh, you might ask? Well, it's a learning content management system. You can see why she turned my head. I mean, isn't this beautiful? And it's, you know, it's, it's just raw content, right? It's just raw data, um, text, images, uh, videos, all of the learning content that, that we create is housed in a, a learning content management system. But, you know, to our needs, we can have multiple outputs. It's searchable, it's reusable. Um, and it's version controlled. So it meets all of those needs. So this is, uh, this certainly speaks, speaks to the why. Why did we choose uh, something outside of edX Studio? But you might be, might be wondering how, how we did that. So again, uh, very, pretty simple here. We, we author inside the LCMS. Our authors, our subject matter experts come in here and they author directly inside there. Then what we produce is raw XML. So we take that we take that XML from the from the LCMS and we convert it to OLX. For those that don't know, OLX is the proprietary uh, XML standard that you can import into uh, into edX. And so those schemas are, are very different, right? What we get out of the LCMS is very different from the schema uh, of OLX. So we need to trans uh, we transform that with XSLT. There's some uh, additional extensions that we also use to do to do lots of other things, but in general, it's it's a it's a straight transformation. We then upload that to GitHub, uh, where we also version control the course itself. And then through automation, we push that to edX. So in addition to the, um, to, to the content itself, we can also do a lot of other things. We get a lot of other benefits. Uh, so some things you guys might use you know, in advanced settings or scheduling details, we can do some of those things as well through this automation. Uh, we also add progress checkpoints. So these are ways that we um, that we track student progress, we put those on every single unit. And so can you imagine doing that in studio, adding that unit to every single, adding that to every single unit? So we can do that programmatically. Uh, in addition, we have uh, other pages that we add. So we have a mentor, a mentor tab uh, that we include in all of our courses, as well as what you see here is the home tab. So we use that to kind of put some boilerplate welcome text to our students. And so we can automate all of that as well. Discussions, if we want them on every single page, we just um, check a box when we do that conversion and we can put a discussion on every single page. And then uh, an end user license agreement, some of our vendors require this and we basically block all of the content until uh, a user says, yes, I, I accept your end user license agreement. So if we need to put that in, we can also do that programmatically. So you may ask, was it worth it to do all of this conversion? You know, Studio works very well. Um, and so one of, our, one of our big wins was when we needed to launch our platform last year, 
we needed over 100 courses in the platform. And so in about six months, we were able to convert from existing content uh, and building some new content, uh, over 100 courses, and we were able to launch that in the platform uh, on time. Today, we continue to update that uh, XSLT tool, adding new features. Um, so if we make a new X block, for instance, we need to roll that into the conversion. But uh, we're constantly adapting that and, and adding to it. No, it's, uh, I'm actually done. So perfect timing. So thank you very much. Any questions now? Or? Uh, yeah, we have time for one, quick, one question as we're uh, transitioning. The X blocks you use are <clears throat> the standard at XX blocks, or do you have anything proprietary or different? Both. Um, so mostly the, propri the proprietary X blocks, but we also do use uh, our own. We have a Vimeo X block that we use for our videos, and then we're building new um, problem X blocks uh, that are on there. So yeah, we, we built new ones, and we have to figure out the conversion for those as well. Christopher started off uh, before I could introduce him, but I can now introduce uh, Lars Walter, uh, giving the next Lightning Talk CMS backend for Open edX. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Lars. Um, I'm from a small company in Germany, and um, we support our clients in topics like knowledge management, intranet, and so on. And I agree absolutely with uh, Christopher. Uh, sometimes it's necessary uh, to think about how can I create or edit um, content outside the um, Openmatic Studio because it's not so uh, rich and features to edi editing content. And um, the same question like Christopher, the question is why? Why we, we do so? Um, because creating content is the most expensive thing in the um, publishing an online course and um, we need the same content very often in different purposes like knowledge management very often in our customer cases we have the uh, request hey uh, we need the content we have learned in the course every day for my business processes so uh, it's good to have some text um, snippets in the uh, knowledge management too in the intranet and for documentation of business processes. And it's clear, in different online processes, we often use the same content. Um, we have content storages for some types of uh, online content, like videos and uh, pictures. We have the stock that databases and for videos, the so well-known um, video hosts, like Vimeo or YouTube and what we have for structured text. We use Plone for structured text for our, uh, Plone is our uh, structured text storage. We call him a, a structured text sto storage. And we use him, uh, we use Plone directly uh, connected with Open edX. Um, we use for this a uh, RESTful API. It's called Plone REST API. <coughs> and uh, if we read the content directly from Plone, we get the content as JSON object and we can read it and we can uh, do some small customizations on the content and then, um, and then embed it in an online course. In my mind, Plone is a, Plone is a powerful open source uh, content management system based on Python. We have a workflow management system, we have a versioning uh, system in the backend and yeah, we can, uh, uh, we can, we have a very good uh, publishing process. And um, here is a, a simple example for this. Very often you need uh, symbols or icons uh, to show the user how, you, how the user can navigate through the online course. And uh, this example you need in all your online courses. And therefore it's um, a good thing to edit such a, a text um, in an external system, we use Plone for this, and then connect um, uh, this, uh, and then connect the content via a Plone REST API. Um, we have written um, an X block, an X block uh, called Plone Content for this, and it's very simple in handling. Um, what do the X block? Uh, we make 
authentication against the CMS backend. We um, negotiate um, an authentication token and get an uh, we, we negotiate and get an authentication token. We read the content as a JSON object and extract the um, content, uh, the JSON content on the um, addict side. We can do uh, some small customizations on it. And last but not least, embed the content in uh, open edX. So um, that's from me. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Natalie, or Natalia, it's the same. I'm from Raccoon Gang, we came from Ukraine. And today, today I want to speak a little bit about SCORM X-Block. Maybe some of you already know about it. That's why the presentation calls this what's new in SCORM X-Block, because it's on the market for, for some time. Uh, so, what's new in it? Uh, first of all, if you didn't yet use the SCORM X-Block, what is it? As Christopher and Lars mentioned, sometimes we need to implement courses outside of edX Studio and to make sure that it appears in edX somehow. And uh, what we do is that we implemented the X block that allows, if you have the, your uh, course in SCORM file, then you can just upload the SCORM file into that X block. Uh, and that's how you embed it into the uh, open edX. A little bit more uh, about that. Uh, settings is that you can also make it scored or the scores may be false or true, so it may be scored or unscored. If it's scored, then the student score will be passed to edX and stored there. Also, you can um, play with the width and high and make it like bigger or smaller. Let me show you, it will look like that, so bigger or smaller. Um, what else? Yeah, that's it. What else do I need to mention is that uh, the X block is open source, so you can use it anytime. It's on GitHub. The documentation is comprehensive. Everything is understandable. You can install it. And if you cannot, for sure, you can contact us. We can help you with that. Um, so what's new in SCORM X block? That was a overview of what is the X block and what's new. First of all, we now support SCORM 2004, not only SCORM 1.2. And uh, the second thing, which like my favorite, <laughs> is that mobile application interaction. You know that OpenEdX has a mobile application. Uh, it can, uh, the student can access several types of content like chat boxes, multiple choices, video, HTML. And now with this X block, if you install it on your edX, your students will be able to access the SCORM using their mobile application. Let me show you how it works. Uh, I need to go. Here. Okay, so basically uh, you go through, you, you choose the course, you choose the type of content, content and uh, here you go. It plays, you can pause or switch to the next model. Pretty easy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, what's even better is that uh, your students may pre-download the content, and uh, after they don't have like, like Wi-Fi, they can play it without any internet connection. Um, all of that is available on our demo raccoongen.com. I mean, not the mobile part, the score mix block per se. So if you want to use it, you may go there. We have a script like with all the credentials and all of that in this document where the link is. You can uh, just try your SCORM file, whether it works before you uh, want or don't want to use it. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty it. Thank you for attention and um, you're welcome to use it. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. 
are using any kind of external NLS to track the data? Uh, do, do we use, sorry, say it again? Like an external NLS to track the data. Uh, to analyze it? Like a learning report system, or store, sorry, learning report store to track all the data. Uh, like uh, learning loggers or cloud, stuff like that. Okay, I didn't use it personally. Maybe we do. Let's but let's uh, talk about that after. Uh, then maybe because uh, I I want to learn more about it. <laughs> yes. If the learner downloads the score and it's a quiz or something, and do it will it be rescored when they get back online. Yeah, I think Could so. Could you uh, repeat uh, the question for the microphone? Sure. Uh, you. So you're asking whether if the user. If the score is assessment, and uh, if a user went offline, when they receive the score, right? Uh, yeah, I think they will receive it once they become become online again, because uh, mostly we use it for not assessments, but for just watching the uh, videos, not, not videos, the content per se, not the assessments. But I think you can use it as well. We need to try it. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Actually, the makes some space for you to do that during the questions. But we do have a bit of breathing room in this session. Fantastic. Yeah. So our, uh, our last lightning talk of this walk uh, is uh, by Krishan. Uh, great use cases of adaptive learning in open edX. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing? <laughs> Let's get some energy in the room. Okay, this is the last lightning talk and then we head into the afternoon. So, uh, so my name is Krishan uh, Mithu. I'm one of the founders of Provesti and we provide um, online program management uh, for organizations. So this is looking at all aspects of running and maintaining an online program from design uh, to delivery. Um, so I'm going to kind of spend a little bit of time with you talking a little bit about adaptive learning. And in a lot of ways, I feel like adaptive learning is a little bit like teenage sex. Everyone's talking about it. Uh, those that are are doing it very badly and you know unfortunately we just end up in this vicious cycle where you go to various conferences and everyone says adaptive learning is the future. So what I wanted to do is kind of leave you with some thoughts uh, today and some inspirations of things that we can do. We are proactively uh, pursuing this and I kind of give some signposts of what we've learned and what we've still got to figure out. So let's just start with the definition. So I mean ultimately adaptive learning is about a series of technologies that really understand and respond to the student ultimately. Um, and then we can dynamically provide them with support. So this may be through uh, gestures, the ideal content, uh, through to even assessments. So I think where we get often lost is we get into echo chambers around hype, and I think one of the things we want to do is kind of demystify a little bit about this. Um, and the truth is it really does have the potential to revolutionize the way we learn. We're actually experimenting, we're going to be releasing a number of Xbox which will allow you to actually take a content store and be able to try some adaptive elements. So we're already doing this uh, with some organizations we work with. Um, and what's really exciting about this is if you think about it, one of the biggest challenges facing MOOCs today is generally around engagement and completion. So on average, we're looking at as an industry, we're about 11, 12 uh, percent, you know, of the actual population completing those courses. Now, we can't account for every single reason why a learner might not want to complete a course. You know, it may be they're busy, life happens, but also there are such things as they've been uh, hit with um, some paid ads, they get excited thinking that this may be uh, the solution to problems they have, but once they get into the experience, they realize it's been miscommunicated. It's not really what they say they're doing. Um, and sometimes you get a recommendation, it may not be right. So what we can do, and the real power of this, uh, this, this sort of you know, movement towards creating more curated, focused experiences is really about being sympathetic to the user, their needs, their wants, and where they're going. So we're gonna run through uh, some examples. And so one of my favorite things thinking about organizations we work with is thinking about when someone joins a new organization. 
So imagine a world, and actually what we're going to do with each of these examples, we'll be doing a blog series where we'll show some more in more depth than I can in five minutes. But uh, world-class onboarding. So you've joined a new company. Um, it could be like we've got one of our friends here from McKinsey. They've just come on board, they've come from another country, and they're learning about the organization. They can understand not only the office they're working in, who they're going to be working with, and what their expectations are. And here's what the thing is. Everyone starts at a different place in life. So we've worked with, for example, Emirates Airlines, who will have some people who have been in the industry for three years, and some people who have just, this is the first time they've ever flown on a plane, and they're put through the same 12-month training program. Like, how is that fair? And how is that curated? And how is that right for the individual? So as I say, we can definitely streamline a lot of these processes, particularly when we look at industry, um, and really help people get up to speed so that they can deliver value add. Just to give you an example, the average graduate, when they go into the workplace, it takes them 12 months before they even provide any value to the company. At that point, for the whole year, they're at cost. They're not able to perform and deliver what's needed in terms of the business case. So, you know, this kind of nicely brings us on to tactical professional development. You know, everyone has learning needs. And as we progress, um, we're seeing, you know, there's new disruptions in society. So everything from, like, for example, we have cryptocurrency and the things in terms of what blockchain can do to automate uh, a lot of what we're doing. And so I'm not going to get into the hype of cryptocurrency in a sense, but actually just the streamlining of technology and how we're seeing convergence means actually there's going to be a lot of disruption in the, uh, in the, in the job place. So by 2020, we're looking at as much as uh, incredibly, you know, 30% of the jobs we have today being wiped out. And after in 10 years, 50%. So we're looking at a huge disruption in the workplace. So we can get tactical. We can really focus on professional development and keep people not only in jobs, but help prepare, prepare them for the future. Again, it's about focus, time, and delivery. Um, and this, again, following this thread of timing, um, recruitment. So again, every company out there is now starting to look for who is that talent that is going to change the organization. It's a bit like if you warrant to uh, sports, uh, if you look at, if you follow sports at all, someone like a uh, Premier League team assigning a big star player, or it could be an ad agency you've just taken on someone and she may have just completely disrupted the industry, or well, you brought that person in the team, well guess what, you're going to be leveled up. And that's exactly what we're talking about. By based on behaviors and how people interact with technology, we can definitely uh, create experiences where we know that this person's going to really be a rock star, and let's support them and get them into potentially other jobs. So imagine that as part of your recruitment funnel for organizations to one, upskill audiences that you may already be doing, but then actually using that as a recruitment tool would be very, very powerful. And as I say, we're going to do a blog series on this, so I can't wait to uh, share more. So one of the misconceptions of, uh, I feel, with adaptive learning is that it's about content. Well, what about experiences? Here's the thing. If you are a right to left-hand person, you're going to interact with particularly mobile screens a very different way. And what about, you know, for example, certain disabilities like being colorblind or even uh, just you're a kinesthetic learner. You need, you, need a, you, need, you, know, you need immersive content you can interact with. So Natalia talked earlier about, you know, SCORM and using those sort of Xbox to have create more interactive interactions. Well, actually, why can't the platform learn from your past behavior and reinvent and readdress and better work to suit your needs? You know, we're seeing more and more personalized services, whether it's in fashion, in retail, through to, you know, the experiences we buy. And, you know, we are all consumers, and, and it, I just challenge you to look at all the stuff you bought and see the amount of customization you can do today. My, my theory is actually that this will continue. Um, and actually, some of where this is coming from, I often play the role of futurist for organizations. So I've literally done the initial concepts for, like, Tron, and we were thinking about this 10 years ago. So this is kind of amazing to be sat here talking to you about this. But this is, I think, the end game. Like, why is it that, you know, we say that often schooling is just specifically for a period in your life? You know, there are some studies that have gone out to prove that actually around about 60% of what we learn is delivered in over five years span in our life. Like, and if you think about it, as we, we've talked already about how the world is shaping and adapting, we've talked about how actually there is, you know, a greater churn and, and, and change that could be quite catastrophic for some people. But actually, if we're always continuously learning, if we're always continuously striving, there is an in incredible future there for us. And I think it's when it comes to uh, producing these technologies that we need to think about how we can better introduce these and not get caught up in the hype cycle. I want to say a big thank you and for being such a wonderful audience. If you've got any questions, I got you. So, so is there any actual stuff behind these ideas that we can play with or look at? Yeah, so uh, we're, when we do the blog series, we're going to point you to a couple of resources. 
Um, so one of the things we're looking at is how you can take masses of content and better curate them. So imagine being able to have a library of content um, that you may be learning on side to, to the side of an existing program. We're also going to be sharing a little bit about a subscription platform we're building in the future where actually we've taken it the other way around. So based on your behaviors and attributes, we're recording all that data. And then we actually use that to better optimize the next round of content. So we'll actually be sharing more the logic and the theory behind it because actually that I think is fair for others to, to have a go at. Because again, you know, I think the whole thing I love about Open edX and the whole community is that I think we should be more of a sharing culture, particularly in the kind of age we're in and the, this sort of technology being so nascent. Uh, but yeah, we'll definitely, as I say, be uh, sharing more information. Do we have time for one more question? Uh, we okay. just as we know, we have the room for another 20 minutes. Yeah. And I want to give a thanks to uh, Kishan. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. But I wanted to open up the floor up to yeah uh, any or all of our speakers uh, in a more general sense. But, uh, so would you like to bring him back? Uh, well, we're pretty informal yeah. here, so people cool. just want to stand up so that we know where you are. Yeah, so we can see the speakers? Yeah. But uh, if there are any... Uh, we can go up there. Yeah, come, Joe. Uh, it's all good. Come on. Well, we want to... Just make a Yeah, we can do that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. if there are any questions or... Come to come to It's just good. It's great. So out of the LCMS, we can also export SCORM content if we needed to. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we are not doing that. We're keeping our content proprietary on our platform. Um, but we, but we can if we needed to. If someone required a SCORM package, we could, we could produce that. A quick follow-up: The LCMS use is that something that you built, or is that a system that you used and adapted? Uh, we purchased a system called Xylene. Xylene. Okay. Xylene. Yeah. What was it called? Xylene, X Y L E N E. Also, uh, if no one else has got a question, I've got a question actually. Sure. Um, so, we're talking about authoring tools. Um, I think it would be always only fair if we give feedback. Like, I mean, what from all your journeys and all the things you've tried, um, what do you think are perhaps what's the biggest thing that, you know, Studio is missing today? Because, you know, the fact is you went and like built a whole workflow and process. Yeah. You built a, a whole tool and you know, you're yeah. kind of like almost creating middleware that yeah. kind of helps us bring content from other places. Yeah. So I'm just kind of very interested to see like what have you learned from it? And I've got some thoughts from what we've seen from our learning design team. I, I think we have been, in the studio we have uh, one folder um, to put assets in it mm -hmm. and we have, uh, we have an editor and we can uh, use the content within only one course. Sure. So, and it's not, um, um, a, a, a library yeah. we can we can reuse content in in different courses or in different contexts so and that's a main problem i think uh, that we uh, we can content use only in one course and we have no workflow and no publishing process for this content so that's my um, that's, that's my great problem okay. at the moment yeah. uh, in some of our cases, uh, one of uh, instructor, not one of uh, several instructors, actually asked for the um, X block or something where they can evaluate the students by themselves. Uh, like we do have some X blocks, like staff grade and assignment and uh, aura X block, but uh, still I, I don't know why it. It was not satisfied for them, so they wanted something new, where the student can, they can just evaluate was not the MOOC, just like for the courses, uh, the small ones, where anyone can evaluate the student's work, not only each other, like not peer-to-peer -peer assessment, but the staff evaluates the student. It, I don't think this is the greatest thing that is missing from studio, I'm not saying that, it's just something that uh, I was asked to say several times. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm, it's tough to say it's missing. I mean, the biggest thing for us, as I said, was just single sourcing, separating from the presentation yeah. layer of 
yeah. of, of, of NX, right? But to, to try to think to add that in doesn't make a lot of sense either, right? Because people are often authoring just for that. They're not, they don't have other, they're not making books, they're not making other things. So that was our, our biggest challenge with it. Um, but I don't know that, uh, I'm trying to think how, 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 they, how that could be accomplished anyway, right? Like, can you say, hey, I, I've got this course built, now make me a PDF book or something. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's possible. Um, I don't know how many use cases there are, but. So I, I, I'm pretty new to edX and, and both the studio and the, the learner experience, but it seems to me, so picking up on something you brought up in your talk, Chris, um, if I'm a learner and I come across some content that's actually useful to me, I believe actually sometimes that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, is there some extension, some X block, some something in edX right now, or you as a content provider can say, hey, here's how you can get to this again. Here's how you can bookmark this to okay. some other, well, outside of the context of taking the course. Well, I mean, actually in the LMS, you do have the feature to bookmark, to bookmark yeah. but it's bookmarking literally the whole unit. Yeah. Um, you can't go at a sub, uh, so there's not sub layer. No. Um, I think that does raise an interesting point. I mean, I feel like personally, I think one of my sort of just challenges is because we're in a unique position. We not only develop the technology, but we produce the courses. So we have literally editors who will upload the programs in multiple mm -hmm. languages. And I think like holistically, you know, if you look at there is basically it's just it's, it's just a lot of it's quite a high learning curve because you've got to know where what they where things are. And so you're going from, OK, I need to edit the about page. It's in one section quite deeply buried and that's more of a legacy thing and edX has moved so much more since then but then you have like you know the actual course experience and trying to edit and, and keep those things up to date and one of the things we're developing now actually for studio which is helpful I think for most people is uh, we're now doing it developing the editing tools so that they can edit in multiple languages such as um, Hebrew Arabic which we've done for campus and a couple of other organizations we work with but even that like just having that level of control like if you think about it, if you had a mission control like that would be super helpful for our editors where they can really dial up things, maybe call in an X block. Yeah. Like I think there's a lot of potential with Studio still that can be tapped, which is yeah. quite exciting. Yeah, one way we sort of work around that is um, oftentimes our authors will include a lot of downloadable content right there, right? So if there are worksheets or if, there, if that piece of content can be like a PDF, yeah. we'll say download it here and then you can, you can also sort of take yeah. it with you so you don't have to rely just on the platforms, yeah. uh, bookmarking or something like that, so. For sure. Question on the adaptive learning: Are you developing your own recommendation engine, or are you going to tap into like Newton? So actually, we looked at both. So initially, at one point, we were going to develop our own adaptive learning engine, but then, and we were actually going to get an investor on board, and that was a conversation I was having personally. However, what we realized is there's a lot of smart people putting their time into this. And uh, I'm an ex-lead designer at Jaguar. The thing we would do all the time as a Jaguar design philosophy, we basically created Hunger Games. And that's exactly what we're planning to do, is to be able to compare various um, adaptive learning engines. And we've kind of done a lot of this due diligence already. So we know which adaptive engine to pick for which purpose. So just, I think, I'm not sure if it's ever been communicated, but there is like a, so, what, one of the ways that edX works with partners is that there are like several steering groups and committees and also if you go on the Slack group, you can collaborate on some of these topics. So if you're interested, you can follow that for sure. Um, but we're working with a number of organizations which include our friends at uh, OpenCraft, AppSembler, on looking at actually how do we do, how do we deliver uh, adaptive learning for edX. And so this is obviously led by edX, um, but we're working quite closely with them because, I mean, in, a, in essence, there's quite a few steps to creating adaptive learning uh, program on, a, on this platform. Number one is actually the interface. You need to be able to change the content that is loaded on the fly. So that creates some infrastructural changes. Then we also have the content itself. We need to be able to meta tag so we have reference points that we can pull those pieces of content. And that even gets before we get into the recommendation engine itself. Uh, so personally, I'm trying to get us to a point where we can plug and play different technologies because everyone has different cost bases. So to give you an example, you mentioned Newton earlier, phenomenal platform, but the cost of running Newton is exceptional versus, you know, there are lighter solutions out there. So we're actually sort of actually promoting some of these like lighter offerings to get people started and thinking about it. But also like there's a lot that can be achieved that we want to achieve, sorry, that so we want to achieve by um, adaptive learning. It can be done through really good instructional design, we're finding. Um, but it really, it's a process. So first things first is we want to be able to make sure that it's switchable, so you can plug in the best of 
breed almost. Um, and then again, this speaks to edX's overall architectural strategy. There's a lovely lady called Namisha. Feel free to reach out to her. Um, she's looking at actually how we can use LTI and various other APIs to kind of enable this better. And I think that's where kind of ultimately we'll end up going. But hopefully that's helped. I wanted to kind of give people an overview of our, like how it's happening. Um, so as I say, it's not just one organization in isolation, just to be clear, there's actually a consort, like there's a group of us that are thinking about this and it will happen. And as you saw from Anand's talk, it's quite high on the priority for edX. So, yeah. so is there a Slack page for, for this discussion? I mean, yeah, I'm sure there is actually. I'm not in that, but we just have like a sort of a, an email chain. We have like, you know, sort of meetups where we actually have talks and we compare notes about what's working. And of course we work in digital sphere of Git repos and you know there's some ideas throwing around so it's um but you're right I mean I'll double check and if it's possible we can share that out uh, after the talk. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh are there any other questions? I saw like, yeah. a couple of you are using like uh, Vimeo or YouTube as a video video delivery platform. Are those video public or private? And if they are private, what's what's the work? So we, we, use, we use Vimeo, it's all private. Uh, all of our videos are whitelisted to, uh, to our platform and then some other things that we end up using. Um, and so part of our conversion process uh, takes those, um, takes where we say there's a video and it kind of, it loops back to Vimeo and says, hey, is this, does this one exist? Let me include that link as a, it's our Vimeo X block. And so we do it that way. If somebody passes that link, it's not whitelisted. So somebody else won't be able to see it. So what did you do with Vimeo Pro? If we go Vimeo Pro? Yeah. I don't know. Are there other implications to that? Is that? Because I know there's like an <coughs> authentication that needs to happen. I was yeah. guessing if you guys might it. Just, I, I don't know if we have Pro or not. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I admit we use our own proprietary technology because we do adaptive video streaming and lots of crazy stuff, including a lot more on automating transcription. So we use AI to do that and yeah. stuff like that. What's, what's your platform? So it's our own. So it's because we produce a lot of content, we need something that'll be quicker, more dynamic. And also we're serving uh, people in the global south, so Africa, Latin America, and there you may have very intermittent issues in terms of connectivity. YouTube isn't often up to task. Uh, so we've had to develop a different way. Uh, I think basically there's gonna be some coalescence in terms of video pipeline. So we're speaking to Edix about that. Um, but we ended up developing our own solution just because you know we looked at YouTube and we partnered with YouTube when we started. They're great. So for, just so you know, like with YouTube, similar to Vimeo, you can basically um, delist your videos and so no one can get to the link. And that's a nice way to get started with Studio and particularly just getting up to speed. Uh, but it depends what your design point is. If you need it to be corporate um, compliant, there's some uh, issues around using YouTube and also Vimeo as well. So it just won't play with most corporate entities. Again, that was a reason why we had to come up with our own solution. So literally, Amazon streaming server was version 0.1, and then we've optimized and improved since then, like quite massively. Um, so I think it's just thinking about what, what works for you tactfully. And also, like the other thing I'd mention about YouTube specifically, it doesn't really play well with mobile. So you mm. do have to, if you're going to be delivering on edX mobile, you do need another solution. So just so you know. And did you have a thought? No. Cool. Let's do one more round of thanks for our speakers. Thank